Hey guys, real quick before we get started with this new episode, just to let you guys know, obviously this is going to be War in the Pacific, uh, but tomorrow I'm planning on streaming some, or actually tonight I'm planning on streaming some U-Boat, which is a new uh, sort of crew management uh, submarine simulation game. So I'll be streaming that over on Twitch, and then you'll probably see my first impressions of that on YouTube tomorrow. Uh, and that may juggle my schedule a little bit as I kind of still figure out where to slot in the strategic command stuff and um, some of my other projects going on, We the Revolution, etc. Uh, but I do plan to stream U-Boat, and then um, we'll kind of continue layering in Strategic Command and We the Revolution where it makes sense. I do post a, uh, a schedule over on my Discord, over at uh, Tortuga's Discord that I've got a channel at, so feel free to check that out if you're curious at what's coming next. But with that being said, I'll step aside and let's get into the episode. Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to War in the Pacific Admirals Edition, our Let's Play series against XTRG, and today's replay is of January 7th, 1942. Uh, we are playing through uh, a Japanese assault here in the South uh, Pacific here. They landed last turn, I believe it was, on the island of New Caledonia, and uh, today uh, that Operation appears to be continuing with Japanese cruisers bombarding our troops. Remember, this is a play-by-email game against XTRG. Uh, we've played through about a month of the war. Uh, turns play out in one-day increments, and uh, so far there have been no major carrier engagements. The Japanese have been making a drive on the Fiji Line, as we're calling it, a series of islands here ranging from Samoa to the Fiji Island Group. To New Caledonia, sort of a northern barrier of ours uh, between Australia and uh, New Zealand in the south, and the Japanese are assaulting New Caledonia, which honestly is the least important of these islands because its location means it can sort of barely reach Australia for bombing raids, uh, but not decisively because his fighters will be really, really stretched out at that range while our defensive units will be able to uh, kind of hunker in. And he can't really get far enough south with his bombers uh, to fully shut down New Zealand from a supply perspective. Uh, so it's an interesting position. Without Fiji, I don't think it's a devastating move. Uh, but it's also, because of that, it's one of the reasons we don't have a super robust garrison on the island. So he probably will succeed eventually in his operations there. Uh, certainly at least on the northern tip near Comac and maybe eventually as far south as Nomaya where we have a bit of a stronger force. Anyway... You can see cruisers are bombarding there, um, and uh, the Japanese are continuing their uh, their maneuver against the uh, base on Comac. Okay. Also, that position would be very vulnerable to being cut off because it is very exposed. The one thing it might do is effectively allow him to take all of New Guinea, like Port Moresby, etc., uh, but... Honestly, Port Moresby is kind of in a similar situation where it's a little bit remote and doesn't do a whole lot for him if he takes it other than theoretically allow him to bomb northern Australia, which I'm not too worried about. Uh, meanwhile, you can see Japanese uh, task forces with destroyer escorts, so this minesweeper won't be heroic like the last one, moving in toward Davao uh, and presumably about to land troops there. Um, cargo ship near Johnson Island is taking torpedo hits. Uh, unfortunately, oh, and it sank, damn. Unfortunately, Johnson Island's ports are too small to provide protection against submarines, which means it's one of those bases that he can move submarines in and torpedo us. We can put mines there to deter him. Uh, most of our bases that are important do have mines, uh, but unfortunately we just don't have the, uh, the resources to mine every port right now. We don't have a whole lot of mines, or mine layers. Okay... Uh, we're into the air phase of this turn, recon being a little bit um, uh, prominent at the moment. We'll see where we actually have large-scale fighter and bomber raids. A lot of recon over Comac. Looks like some 70 bombers are hitting Clark Field, where we have a couple of divisions of Philippine troops uh, kind of in the rear, kind of hanging out there, uh, preventing the full encirclement of the troops at Bataan, uh, up against the peninsula there in Luzon. You can see they're bombing, but not a lot of effect. Another bombing raid of 13 lilies. We don't really have a lot of fighters in Bataan. I think we've got like six P-35s. Uh, so our ability to do anything against these bombing raids is going to be pretty limited. Uh, meanwhile, some bombing raids near Wuchou in China. Quite a bit of Japanese heavy bomber activity uh, this turn. 
Japanese bombers hitting the city of Maidan on the north coast of Sumatra, where we have some uh, Dutch bombers that are kind of just hanging out. Uh, some recon over Rehang, Nanyang. Okay, more recon over Clark Field. It's a pretty quiet turn so far. Cruiser bombardment at the beginning was kind of the biggest piece. Meanwhile, we've got Japanese carrier uh, torpedo bombers uh, up against the mine sweeper, the Penguin, uh, on the southern coast of Mindanao. The Penguin escaped the Japanese landing force, or what I assume is the Japanese landing force, but it will not escape the uh, Japanese uh, bombers there. So it sinks. The Japanese bombers get a little bit of target practice. That's fine. It tells us the carriers are moving east away from Balak Poppin. Meanwhile, the Maryland is suffering some flotation damage. We're trying to get the damaged battleships from Pearl Harbor into the uh, into U.S. West Coast ports where they can be repaired more quickly. We have two that had to stay behind at Pearl due to extensive damage. We also have two that are back online and are on their way to bombard Midway um, because they've already been fully repaired. Uh, the S-27 attempting to torpedo some patrol boats, but instead is taking a depth charging. Took one hit. Amphibious landings on Davao. Japanese losing some casualties, but we don't have any troops there, so they're going to take the base. Task force is checking fuel. Pretty quiet turn. Whoa, a shock attack. Japanese are launching a shock attack at Clark Field with three full divisions. They've been attacking sort of hesitantly here, and we've been slowly pushed back. Our fortifications have been reduced, but we have not been defeated yet. Uh, we've actually inflicted more casualties on the Japanese in every attack so far at Clark Field, but we are in the process of falling back. We did switch our troops mode over to uh, combat mode, uh, but they are still retreating to Bataan. They should be able to get out of there in the next day or two, assuming they're not driven back right here. This is a very large Japanese assault. Uh, more than a thousand attack value looks like it's on the map here. No. Can I do math? I can't do math. That's 600. That's nine. No, yeah, over a thousand attack value here. He's got three tank, four tank regiments, uh, or a recon regiment and three tank regiments, two guards, battalions, an artillery mortar battalion, and three infantry battalions. A shock attack basically means they're doing a bayonet charge, so think of a bonsai charge, which can be incredibly destructive if they succeed. Like, we could lose 10,000 plus casualties if they succeed, but if they fail, it can also be very bloody for them. Uh, so we'll see how this plays out. We're going to fast forward through here and see... Oh, thank God. Well, the Japanese did not break through. Uh, they did manage one-to-one -one assault odds, so unfortunately we don't really give them a bloody nose. We do inflict more casualties on them, 2,100 against 1,200, so that's a good day uh, for our soldiers. We lost a few more units destroyed, 26 squads destroyed versus 19 on his end, but he lost more than two times as many troops disabled as us. So he lost 160 squads disabled, we lost 70, uh, which means that it's unlikely I think he would attack again. Non-combatants 2 to 1. Uh, again, far more disabled non-combatants for us than him, but he's attacking, so that's to be expected. 31 engineer squads disabled on his end, only 2 on our end. 33 guns destroyed for us. He lost 1 vehicle destroyed, 4 disabled. We lost 14 guns destroyed, 19 disabled. Uh, but you can see here the 33rd, 16th, and 4th Japanese infantry divisions assaulted Clark Field. The Filipino infantry divisions that we still have here, as well as some support units, all kind of held the line, if you will. And we were able to hold the base, which is important because, again, we would have lost five to six times as many casualties if we had been pushed back. At the end of the day, while there's some disruption in our ranks, the soldiers largely remain intact. Uh, and even though we changed their, their orders from uh, move to combat, uh, they were on sort of a... Uh, they were still issued orders to retreat to Bataan, so those soldiers are going to get another six or seven miles closer to Bataan. I'm hoping by next turn they will be out, with the exception of a few support units, which I didn't move. Uh, and uh, that means that we probably will hold Clark Field. I'm guessing for two more days. I doubt he attacks again after a shock attack like that doesn't succeed. Uh, and so we'll probably hold Clark Field until the December 9th turn, I would guess. It'll fall into his hand the December 9th turn. Uh, which I'm okay with, um, because I think historically the Battle of Bataan started on Jan 7, uh, I think, 
which means that uh, you know we're a little bit a little bit hanging on a little longer. Meanwhile, Bilip Island here in the northern coast of New Caledonia is going to fall to the Japanese. Um, Comac, we didn't launch any attack at because uh, we just don't have enough st strength there based off what he's attacking with. We have about two to one odds, but we also have fortifications there, so I'd rather kind of sit back and uh, sort of maintain the forts uh, rather than waste our brigade in attacks that won't dislodge the Japanese because they have very good defensive capabilities, and you just don't destroy Japanese units like that. Uh, meanwhile, that's going to about do it for the turn. The combat's over. We're into the supply phase, so it's just going to kind of start showing units that arrive this turn, and then it's going to kick us out to the main screen. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, jump out, and I'll catch you guys on the flip side uh, once we're in our turn. Okay, and we're back, and um, we're looking at our carrier force, which has just raided Tarawa and is withdrawing back onto Pearl Harbor. Uh, we have three carriers out this way. Remember the Lexington, the Saratoga, and the Enterprise. Uh, the carriers are withdrawing in good order. The Saratoga task force decided it did not need more fuel, so okay. Uh, the Lexington task force, you need to replenish from sea. Uh, the uh, fleet oiler that we have nearby is providing some oil, and the Enterprise task force has already uh, done some of its uh, ops expenses. So these guys are all falling back to Pearl Harbor, so far undetected as far as I can tell from the Japanese. Meanwhile, our other force is moving north here. You can see we've got some battleships moving toward Midway to bombard, and we also have some carriers over in this general direction, the USS Yorktown, which will be providing top cover, but also going in to bombard the Japanese. Uh, we're attempting to get another raid on Midway, so he's kind of like, wait a minute, where are the carriers? Are they up in the north? Are they up in the south? And that way maybe he'll sort of drive more subs toward the lone carrier up here uh, and allow these other carriers to move in uh, smoothly. I'm assuming he has subs in the area. He had a ton of subs around Pearl Harbor previously, and we've got this one sub up over here that is moving east. Um, okay. Uh, but anyway, and we know he's had subs on Johnston Island because we've lost several transports in that area. So that's the situation there. Meanwhile, if we move to the South Pacific, uh, we're continuing to unload troops at Pago Pago, and we're continuing to unload supplies here. This is going to be quite a strong bastion if he ever tries to take it. He may bypass it, but if he ever tries to take it here, we've got two regiments. We've got uh, two defense battalions. Uh, the Samoan Marine Defense Battalion has... Uh, a garrison with some troops, but the 7th Marine Defense Battalion has some 6-inch and 3-inch coastal guns. Actually, these are AA, but 6-inch coastal guns, four of them. So that'll be a pretty tough nut to crack, and a lot of these guys have pretty good preparation scores too. So if he does go for Pago, he's in for a rude awakening. Also, we do have some P-40B Warhawks which have arrived, so we've got 14 fighters here. In addition to that, Suva is obviously uh, a strong base as well, up to 30,000 supply. It is building its defenses up. It's up to level 3 fortifications. We're going to keep building those to really make these islands unassailable. The one place that he is assailing us and that I really can't do a whole lot about is at Comac, where we have one Indian brigade here, currently behind level 1 fortifications. I'm hoping before he launches any defenses or assaults against us, we get to level 2. But in any event, it's rough terrain. If we actually hit the number 1 key, we can see that this is jungle terrain. Jungle terrain instantly, if we go up here, gives us a level 3, no, level 2 defensive bonus value. So twice as defensible as clear terrain. So that really will give us an added benefit to our level 1 fort. It may act almost like a level 3 fort. Um, in addition, that does make the fortifications at Nomaya uh, more formidable as well, which are currently level 2, but that kind of, again, it's, there's a defense multiplier by the fact that it is uh, in jungle terrain. So that's good for us. Um, I don't think we can hold Comac, but my goal is to hold as long as we can. And so we've got an Indian brigade here. I uh, should switch that over to defensive. Uh, but he's landing some troops here, and that's that. Meanwhile, we have these cruisers of ours that I had been sailing north toward Comac. Uh, I don't... He's got a task force over here of cruisers. I don't think that's a tanker. There's no way that are moving northeast. We know he had battleships at Esprit du Santu. I don't know what he has in the area. We know he landed at Bilop. We know he's got more forces moving southwest. I'm not really sure. I've kind of I've slowed down my my cruisers. I'm being a little bit more cautious rather than sort of running in a guns blazing just because I really we know he has battleships in the area. We know his carriers were in the area. They were moving north. 
Uh, they could be moving all the way back to truck to resupply, or they could be pulling from, like, resupply tankers and moving south. I don't know. I'd rather not get a task force of pretty good cruisers shot to pieces just to do it. The New Orleans is a 40 victory value. Uh, the uh, Ceres is a good light cruiser with good torpedoes. The Perth is a good British light cruiser with radar. Um, we've got some destroyers in here that I'm not too worried about. But then the Kanbara and the Australia, uh, and I know I'm butchering the pronunciation of that word yet again because I always do it when we're, uh, when we're having our episodes, uh, both have uh, air search radars as well. These are good cruisers. So I don't want to just rush them in Helmel. My hope is I can kind of base out of Nomaya, and then what my plan is is to run um, anti-submarine or sorry anti-shipping uh, recon patrols to see what else is out there, and that we can kind of get a get an eye on him. Meanwhile, we're also converging some submarines on his position uh, to try and pick him off, all while holding a defensive at Comac. That's the situation in the South Pacific. Um, in the area of Borneo. We've got the Hermes, which is out at sea again, remaining on station, waiting to see if he'll bring his carriers or his uh, cruisers back. Maybe we can ambush. Uh, we have replenished our torpedo stocks on the Hermes, so we've got back to 12 torpedoes on those, uh, on those, uh, those decks. Meanwhile, we've got two task forces of tankers. One is moving into Balak Poppin, uh, and then this one is detected. So I don't want to move them to Balak Poppin because he knows they're there, and I'd rather him not sprint his carriers down and hit two tankers here and hit five, six tankers here. That's a lot of victory value worth well more than a battleship. It's a large percentage of our tanker task force. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to split things up. Since he knows we're in this general vicinity, I will use these two tankers as bait as we move into Balak Poppin. Uh, and then maybe he'll go for the tankers, and that'll open things up for the Hermes. While I'm going to take these larger tanker task forces and probably move, move them to Oosthaven, but I'm going to move them along the northern, the south, southwestern coast of Borneo uh, to kind of move away. In the event that he does swing down here, these guys should be out of harm's way to the west, and then we'll decide what to do with them next turn. Um... Not a lot there. We did fight a battle at Clark Field. We did hang on, uh, but you can see our troops here are basically out of supply, uh, and they just barely hung on. The good news for us is all these guys are about to get out of here. So if he does attack again, they'll be out before he actually attacks, at least most of them. There's a couple of engineer units, which I didn't get started till a little bit later, but for the most part, by the end of next turn, uh, our troops, um, the bulk of our strength will be falling back to uh, Bataan, where we'll have about 1,600 garrison strength here. A pretty strong force to resist the Japanese, up to level 3 forts, almost to level 4. I would think we'll get to level 4 in the next 5 days, and uh, that's either right when his troops will arrive, but probably before they have a chance to attack, or uh, a turn or two before his troops arrive at Bataan, which means this is going to be an even tougher nut to crack. Level 4 fortifications with very rough terrain. So uh, Bataan is considered LG, which if we look up here, uh, or is it, I guess it's JG, it's the only one with a G in it, um, which would be jungle. So it's going to be a level 4 fort with jungle fortifications, which will make it that much tougher to crack. Clark Field, on the other hand, where he just attacked, is also, it's a JR, JR is what? JR is jungle and rough terrain, which is actually level 3. So that was actually slightly more defensible terrain, but we didn't have as many forts there. So it wasn't, um, you know, if I could do it again, maybe I would have built up my defenses at Clark Field. But I always had trouble bringing supply forward, so I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, meanwhile, not a lot else is going on this turn, guys. Uh, he's arrived just south of Taipang uh, and the Malay Peninsula. So these guys, the 3rd SSV uh, Battalion, are probably goners. They're all uh, sort of suppressed or they're all dispersed anyway. They don't have any actual combat forces left. So that'll be a problem. Uh, maybe we'll move the 3rd Base Force down to Kuala Lumpur uh, to act as a blocking force. Even though there's only just a few engineers there, they're not going to do much. They just might slow him down a day or so. Um... Not a lot else going on this turn. Uh, if we take a look at our uh, result there, not a lot of air activity. Zero air-to-air -air killed, zero on the field, zero by flak. Five ops losses for him, two for us. Doesn't really mean much. 
Um, looks like just a couple of ones. We lost a B17, not loss. Um, we lost one pilot wounded. We've lost 106 killed so far. Any of our killed be really good? That was a really properly worded English sentence, too. Uh, this guy experienced 48, 59, 59. One really good pilot, R.A. Millwood, uh, level 75 experience. Uh, WG or WD Feelock, also really good, 73. JD Cross, 63. JD Cross was an AVG. Feelock is uh, of the Ford or of the 17th Pursuit Squadron. That's the Aces Squadron. He actually had three kills. That's kind of unfortunate. Um, the 75 guy was part of the Royal Air Force. Uh, a shame he was flying buffaloes. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, not a lot else uh, in terms of like experienced pilots lost. We do have one wounded HS Ellis. Four kills on the verge of being an ace. We actually have a bunch of guys that are almost aces. That's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, not a lot else going on this turn. If we take a look at sort of upcoming units, if we're trying to kind of see what's what should we see is coming in terms of uh, availability coming up soon... Um, well, it looks like it's sorting. So the Hornet, the next aircraft carrier that we're going to get. Let's actually double check. So aircraft carrier. What are we going to get? We get the Indomitable in nine days at Aden. So we get our first British aircraft carrier. Uh, she's going to come with 12 Fulmer 2s. I think those are torpedo bombers or dive bombers. 12 Albacore torpedo bombers and nine Sea Hurricanes. So nine fighters and then 24 bombers on her. So not really ideal for dealing with Japanese carriers, but when she does arrive, we could move her south to meet up with the Hermes. Uh, she does carry up to 45 torpedoes, so we could have her meet up with the Hermes and uh, maybe operate in the Dutch East Indies. We could also see about moving her to join the Americans. The Sea Hurricanes are decent aircraft. Uh, the Albacore is a, a much better torpedo bomber than anything the Americans have currently. Um, so we could see about doing that. But the Indomitable is coming online in about nine days. The Hornet is the next American carrier, 62 days away. And then the Formidable arrives in 66 days. So ten, just, just shy of two weeks, well, a week and a half for the first British carrier and then two months for the second British carrier. This one is even a weird... The British air wings on these carriers are weird. Let's just put it that way. Really light on fighters, really heavy on, on strike aircraft. Um, but it is what it is. No escort carriers coming anytime soon. Uh, battleships, we get the Royal Sovereign at Aden in, in seven days, so she'll arrive roughly with the uh, Indomitable. New Mexico and Mississippi both arrive in two weeks in San Francisco, so we'll have two new American battleships arriving in San Francisco. Uh, older World War I sort of era designs, I believe they've got 14-inch guns. Uh, they do come upgraded already with radar, though, so that's a, that's a positive. Um... Let's see, the Idaho comes in 23 days, then we get some British battleships in about a month. We get the Revenge, the Ramillies, and the Resolution, all in around a little over a month. Uh, and then nothing till June uh, for that. Heavy cruisers or light cruisers, we get the British light cruiser Emerald in one day at Mombasa. The Dorshire, a heavy cruiser at Cape Town in a week. Uh, the Sumatra, uh, a Dutch light cruiser, uh, in 19 days to replace the one Dutch light cruiser we've already lost in this war. The Nashville in about a little over a month. And then another Dutch uh, ship arriving in Mombasa uh, in about 44 days. Destroyers, we're going to get two new destroyers in a week. One at San Francisco, one at M Mombasa, the Terjikids, uh, which I believe is also a Dutch destroyer. It has very good anti-submarine warfare uh, capabilities, though, at level 8. So that should be useful. The American Clark, not so much. Level 2. The American early destroyers kind of suck at anti-submarine warfare. DDEs, not really anything till 43. APDs, we get a couple at Crystal Ball in about a month. Uh, APs. Start getting some replacements for our casualties before too long. The Queen Mary apparently is going to be showing up as well. Uh, cargo ships, yeah, we always get a lot of those every few days. AOs, fleet oilers, nothing for about 83 days. Tankers, about a month till we start getting some more British ones. Subs, we get a whole bunch of subs in about a week. We get the O24, 23, and 22. These are Dutch submarines that are going to arrive at Surabaya. Uh, we're going to get the... Uh, American Silver Sides at Mare Island, and two British, or actually these are American, but they're arriving at Balboa, uh, the Gato and the Finback. 
the British Truant will arrive in a little over a week at Aden. The British subs actually have good torpedoes. They've got a reasonably experienced crew, very experienced crews. These things could actually be pretty useful if we've got an aggressive captain, so we need to keep that in mind. We re recently just had the Trusty arrive, and she's on her way in theater, so it'll be good to have a few British submarines arriving. Um, auxiliary, eh. new mine layer, Tricomali, patrol, blah, 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 landing ships, nothing till late 42 for our LS. We get a couple of LSTs in late 42 and early 43, but that's, that's a ways away. Landing craft, likewise a ways away. Okay, so that's the situation with our shipping in terms of ground units, um, reinforcement schedules. Uh, we start. We get a new Chinese core in two days at Chongqing. Uh, we've got the Guam USN base force. Why Guam? At San Francisco? Did I rebuild that? I don't remember. Uh, the 16th Australian Brigade arrives in about a week at Aden. Interesting. These guys are going to be experienced, I'm guessing. Uh, yep. Level 70 experience, level 70 morale, regular infantry. So these guys are arriving from the European theater. Um, actually, we get a whole bunch in about a week. A bunch of British units arrive in a week, or American aviation units. Just a bunch of units arrive in about a week. So that'll be good. Where's Corvass? I'm not quite sure. Southwest Pacific. A lot of these guys are still restricted HQs, but some of them aren't. A new headquarters arriving. Uh, air units, group reinforcement schedule. What are we looking at? Walruses in one day on the light cruiser Emerald. So that's just a patrol aircraft. 12B339D Dutch Buffaloes at Bandong uh, in two days. Uh, we've got 75 American P-40E Warhawks arriving in two or four days in Brisbane. So Australia is going to be getting 75 American fighters in Brisbane. So if, uh, you know, if we need to use them, I, unfortunately, I don't think they can reach to Nomaya, but they'll at least give the Australian coast a semblance of defense if, if the KB decides to get a little bit ambitious. Meanwhile, the British are getting a whole bunch of hurricanes. Uh, 48 Hurricanes are arriving in Aden here in the next week or so. We're getting some Blenheims also in uh, in there. Uh, and then the Air Wings for... Interesting. We've got another 75 American aircraft arriving two days after. So we got four days. We've got 75 American aircraft arriving at Brisbane. And then nine days from now, we've got another 50 American P-40E Warhawks arriving in Brisbane. Uh, in the 13th and 33rd Pursuit Squadron. So we're going to have 125 American P-40E Warhawks in Australia on the eastern Australian coast in about a week, a little over a week. So that'll be nice. Um, I know one of you had commented in the video, like, what if he comes for a carrier raid or something like that? Uh, at least we'll have something to meet him with, assuming they're in the right place. You know, he might go, Australia's a big place. That's that's not a lot of aircraft to defend it. But I'm more excited because it's it's going to be a heck of a lot easier if we've got like a hundred, you know, if we've got like five or six squadrons of P-40s. Honestly, I'm not worried that he's going to come after Australia. I'm more worried that I have no fighters defending Nomaya. I only have 30 obsolete fighters defending Suva, and I only have 20 de fighters defending Pago. We lost 20 fighters sunk on a cargo ship from Japanese uh, submarines. So if we can put 50 in Suva, 25 in Pago, and maybe 50 in Nomaya, we could make this Fiji line really formidable to anything that he might bring against us. And we can do that really easily because we've got a fair number of cargo ships in Australia as well. So those are some things to look forward to in the coming episodes. That being said, I don't have a lot for you this episode. There's some logistics. I'm moving around some ships. I'm moving around some tankers or whatever. But other than that, not a lot going on this turn. So we're going to wrap it up here. Let me know your thoughts below, uh, and we'll see what happens next time. But until next time, this is the Historical Gamer. Oh, yeah, I did forget he did take Zamboga and Cotabato. All of our troops on the island of Mindanao are concentrated at Kaigan, uh, which is trying to build up some defenses. Now, the one thing is it is on the coast, so he could bombard it. Um, but we do have two, level two forts working up to level three. Uh, it is in a rough terrain. So rough terrain is pretty good from a defensive perspective. gives you level two defenses. And um, we've got, you know, like 200, uh, actually almost 500 assault value here. So pretty strong force here. Um, I don't know how good the troop quality actually is. Third constable, whatever. 
Um, but uh, they're relatively ready. They're relatively planned out for these bases, and uh, we'll see. I mean, if he, he probably would require at least a full Japanese division on the island of Mindanao to uh, to knock these guys out. The only problem is they really don't have much in the way of supplies, uh, so they may be easier to crack if he just waits a little bit. But anyway, that's enough for this episode, guys. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, I'm out.